Here, session three, the church, the body of Christ. Introduction, what do we do when we become the new creation? How do we express our encounter with God? Remember last week, that's what Daniel talked about was the new creation, who we are in Jesus. So how do we express our encounter with God? Our life will never be the same again. So how do we let others know that we have changed sides? Why do the followers of Christ, Christians, do the things that they do? In the following session, we'll discuss the basics of Christianity, repentance, baptisms. And actually, there are three baptisms that, that uh, John the Baptist talked about. The baptism of water, baptism of fire, and baptism of the Holy Spirit. In session four, we'll discuss communion, tithing, prayer, praise, worship, gathering together, becoming members of one body, the gifts of the Spirit, and your place in the body of Christ. Some of this list has nothing to do with becoming a Christian, but everything to do with being a Christian. And again, notice there's a difference between the becoming and the being, the doing and the being. And we're a human being... So we are supposed to be being, not doing. Capital B, Jesus is our way forward. Jesus is our way forward. The arrival of Jesus into human existence signaled a new era in God's dealings with mankind. Man, God intervened in a very personal way and made it unmistakably clear that he was and is on our side. It was and is all presented and worked out in the life, death, and the resurrection of Jesus. Men and women believed that Jesus was God and his death did not and his death did not stop his message but promoted it. Soon they realized that he planned to live in them, and to their surprise they found themselves living in a world where God called all the shots. He was to have the last word on everything, quite literally the first and the last word. Everything had to be re-examined, re-imaged, and re-centered around Christ. And this is still our challenge today. Capital C, the basics. Number one, God's radical transforming power. His radical transforming power. R-A-D-I-C-A-L, radical, radical transforming power. Anyone who met Jesus was never the same. And hopefully that's the same, that's what we can say about ourselves. Mm -hmm. That anyone who met Jesus was never, ever the same again. Either they joined him or they rejected him. Seldom was there any middle ground. Just being in the room with Jesus would have left you different. He was and still is totally, radically challenging. Encountering the reality of Jesus meant allowing everything else to fade. The consequence was their willingness to abandon wealth, power, status, position, and even to giving up their lives. You meet Jesus and change occurs. Can he still do the same today? What do you think? Definitely. As this new life begins to flow through us, we find our thoughts, motives, actions beginning to change. What does a life that has changed sides look like? Without really trying, we find that doing the stuff becomes more natural. So doing the stuff refers to what? Just being a Christian. Whatever a Christian means, doing that, outworking that, just becomes more and more natural for you. Two, the elementary teachings of Christ. The elementary teachings about Christ. There are several places where the Bible sets out the basics of being a Christian. And I put in three different places. One is in Acts 2.38. Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter replied, Repent, be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So that's basically basic basics. Then Acts 2.42 talked about the early church. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread or communion, and to prayer. That's what the early church did. Hebrews 
1, Paul, go, Paul makes a little bit of a list. Therefore, let us leave the elementary teachings about Christ and go on to maturity. And notice he gives the list of things that he considers elementary teachings about Christ. Foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death. Faith in God. Instructions about baptisms. And again, notice it's a plural. The laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. Now to Paul, that was the basics of the Christian gospel. Any comments on his list of what the basics are? What would you have said the basics of Christianity would be? Obedience. Obedience. So that's probably where Paul talked about faith in God, repentance from acts that lead to death. What other basics would you have included in there? Mm -hmm. Forgiveness, so repentance from acts that lead to death, accepting God's forgiveness, yes, as well as applying it. Mm -hmm. Laying on of hands, have you heard many basic teachings on laying on of hands? It's not all that common in lots of different churches. But yes, Paul considered that basic resurrection of the dead, eternal judgment, he considered those part of the basics as well. <coughs> Capital D, we need to start with... And where did Peter start? Repent. Repent. So we need to start with where Peter started, and that was repent. So number one, what does the Bible mean by repent? And a lot of times we throw these words around without really stopping and saying, now what does this really mean? And it often, particularly in church jargon, we talk of some of these words and they just go round and round and round and round. And it does good sometimes to stop and really try to pull the word apart and find out what it really means, what, what reality it has for our life today. So repentance. What does the Bible mean by repentance? The New Testament use of the word repentance, in the Greek it's metamo, met, metaoia, means sorrow for sin and a turning to God. This encompasses recognition of sin, change of mind and asking God's forgiveness. By turning around 180 degrees we gain a new perspective of God's compassion, His truth and love. And that's what repentance is. So it's a sorrow for sin, a turning to God. Repentance is not a self-remorse that I got caught. It's not a morbid or moral, morbid morose sorrow or regret from, for failure. And a lot of people, when they begin to see the, the actions that they had in the past, how God thought about those actions, it isn't so much a godly repentance as, as it is a regret, a sorrow that they just got caught in the whole thing. And that's not repentance. What is the word morose? Morose, a, a depressive, sad, um, gloomy, sort of... Mm-hmm. So it's not a morose, I got caught feeling, a morbid sense of sorrow or regret that they made a mistake. And a lot of people, that's what repentance can be, is the regret that they got caught or that they made a mistake. Nor is it beating ourselves over the head for our past mistakes, a guilty penance sense system where we must atone for our wrong. So repentance isn't where I have to go out and polish a certain number of shoes or say a certain number of things or crawl on my knees a certain distance in order to get God's forgiveness. That's not what forget what repentance is. D, repentance is a gift from a loving God through the Holy Spirit and there is no salvation apart from repentance. And that's an interesting fact because if we stop and think how f how uh, the, the process of repentance is not overly emphasized in our churches today, in most churches today. It's more of a quickie lollipop coming to Jesus type salvation experience. So if there is no true deep repentance, what does that say about that person's salvation? It's a very good possibility that they aren't really saved. Hmm. If they just went through it because uh, their mom was standing there elbowing them saying go on go forward go forward or the pressure of their peers or everybody else in the group was going forward but uh, they didn't want to but finally gave in to group pressure was that repentance no 
that probably isn't salvation. So sometimes it's like the, 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 the salvation experience gets started and it's like the germination of the seed has started. But it's only just begun that little tiny, tiny shoot that comes up from the seed because there isn't, hasn't been a depth of repentance. Two, the essential elements of repentance. So we've seen repentance is not self-morose, it's not a um, morbid sorrow, it's not me having to go through penance to get myself saved. So we need to look at what is in repentance. Well, the first thing is to acknowledge that we're lost and without hope, that we cannot rescue or save ourselves. And Jesus told the story in Luke 15, 3-7 about the shepherd who left the 91, 99 to go and find the one sheep that was lost. And the angels in heaven do what when one returns? Rejoice. Rejoice. They have a big party when one person comes back. So to acknowledge that we are lost and without hope that we cannot rescue or save ourselves. And as we go through this list, think through your own experience when you came to the Lord. If any of this was lacking in your own experience or that you had a good dose of it because sometimes that's what happens too. So to acknowledge that we're lost and without hope. Second, expressing godly sorrow for past sin. And again, it's not regret, it's not, not a guilty sense of I got caught, but a godly sorrow for past sin. And I think of my own conversion experience. There wasn't a whole lot of godly sorrow for the things I'd done wrong. Now certainly I was a 17-year-old, but and I hadn't been out and really been out in the world, but there still wasn't much of a godly sorrow for the things where I'd know that I'd done wrong to God. See, as an act of returning to the Father. Now in my, my conversion experience, there was no element of God the Father in the whole thing. So it wasn't a sense of I was returning back to God the Father. I'd found Jesus, and that was better than nothing, but it wasn't a returning to God the Father, it wasn't a connection between me and God in that sense. D, to receive the ability to accept and believe in Jesus. Now for me that definitely happened, and for most people that's what the spark of the new birth is. But notice that's only one out of six. <coughs> E, to be able to do good works out of repentance. And if I look at my early Christian life, there wasn't a whole lot of doing good works in those first few months after that. F, able to acknowledge and receive spiritual truth. So when true repentance happens, it's like spiritual truth begins to get inside our heart and begins to grow in there. Now, as I look at this list, when I went through as that 17-year-old, that teenager, accepting Jesus, and, and it was a very real experience for me. But if I had to do a rating sheet of all of this, probably the only one is D that I got hooked into, is to accept and to believe in Jesus. And that's mainly where I came into the kingdom. And for me, it wasn't until I went through the baptism of the Holy Spirit that some of this other stuff started even beginning to happen. It wasn't until I met the Holy Spirit that I began thinking about, oh yeah, I was a bit involved in the occult with some of my girlfriends at school. and Oh yeah, I wasn't a very nice older sister to my younger brother. Sometimes I was a real brat to my older brother, to my younger brother. So it wasn't until the Holy Spirit, baptism of the Holy Spirit for me, that this list then became more complete. Any comments on that for yourself? For me, it was a, basically a mixture of that, of all of those. Uh -huh. The only difference is I would say uh, to acknowledge that I was lost. Uh -huh. I, was, I was lost. And then able to acknowledge and receive spiritual truth would have been would have been the big, uh -huh. yes. And then, to me, was the act of returning to a father because my own father and I never had a relationship. Uh -huh. And the thing that really stood out for me was that all the years, the father I thought I didn't have, I had the, the only father. 
I in the Heavenly that, Father. My father I, re- I reestablished my relationship with my own father. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. It allowed me to look through different eyes at my father's life. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they all, yeah, they, uh, there were sections of all of that within mm-hmm. over a In your experience. Period. Well, certainly being able to, to reestablish the contact with your own earthly father is the, the working out the, the fruit, the understanding of what you'd done wrong and what he'd done wrong and restoring relationship was the fruit. Mm. Yeah? Any other comments from anybody else? I was pretty much the same all actually, except for the relationship with my father. I decided that I would try and reestablish that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which upset me, but then I realized, well, it doesn't really matter because of the father. The father. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The yeah. thing I found strange is that I rang my father and I, and I said, Hi, Dad, it's Paul here, I love you. Mm-hmm. And he said, oh, I always thought you did. And he always thought you did. <laughs> yeah, that's good, yeah. So those essential elements of, bab- of repentance in various people are either lacking or only just partial there. And like we'll talk a little bit about further on, I know that a lot of times counseling is exactly the, the remedial work that should have happened when they came to the Lord to start with. So people that, that come to the Lord do a quickie, quickie lollipop birth but have not any idea that the occult was wrong or all the things that they were into in their past, and they, they just go right back to it. And then they wonder why they struggle and wonder why they're having problems, and then they come to a counselor, and then the counselor goes back and works through some of these areas, and the little light goes on. Ah, so that's what it meant to be converted. That's what it meant to really find Jesus. And there's probably a correlation. Like I said, for me, baptism of the Holy Spirit, a lot of these came into action. But when I was in uni, my third year of uni, I walked away from the Lord. So I would suspect that my conversion experience was really lacking. Some of it got added in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but it wasn't until I actually came back after ten years back to the Lord that I had a sense then of returning to the Father. I had a sense then of the godly sorrow for the things that I'd done wrong. So I would I would suspect that most Christians that don't go through a good, deep repentance on their conversion, actually somewhere along the line the Lord brings them back to it and they have to go through it again, one way or another. Hmm. Then the second thing, so repent, and the second part of what Paul, uh, Peter said, and be baptized, every one of you. So repentance and baptism. And actually, as I already said, um, there were three, just looking where, yeah, I did put that in in capital F, that John the Baptist described three different kinds of baptism. So the first one was the water baptism that John the Baptist talked about. The word baptism brings different images to mind in different cultures. For some, it means confusion and choices. For others, pain and even death. In some cultures... Capital E, be baptized, every one of you. Every one of you. So in some cultures, when you switch from Buddhism to, to Christianity, it means you walk out of your whole family home, your whole culture, your whole friends. Everybody turns against you in some places. Or if, if you grow up in a Muslim family, to turn to Jesus. That's a, a big choice for a Muslim to become a Christian because that often means that they have to walk away from their family and their friends and sometimes their work, sometimes they get persecuted and sometimes even beaten and killed for doing that. Number one, water baptism, a sign of repentance. A sign of repentance. The word baptism in Greek means to dip, immerse, put into water to get wet. The 13 baptisms recorded in the New Testament show a public act of confession and a statement of faith. In some places today, as then, by being baptized, people so changed sides that it brought a death sentence from the previous group. The act of baptism has been done in rivers, oceans, 
We've got two rivers. How about that? Rivers, oceans, swimming pools, baptistries, and even in bathtubs. So people, when they feel the Lord saying for them to get baptized, um, go through lots of different experiences. Going out into the ocean is quite an experience, and being baptized in the ocean is quite amazing. But even in bathtubs, people have used that to be baptized. So number two, why would people go through this ritual? Why would people go through this ritual? Well, first of all, as an act of obedience, because Jesus commanded it. How about let's do some of these verses as we go along. Someone like to grab Matthew 28. Someone else, Mark 16, 16. And we've already talked about Acts 2, 38. So someone grab Matthew and someone grab Mark. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to, to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So the Lord said to be baptized. Mark sixteen sixteen. Anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved, but anyone who refuses to believe will be condemned. So here Jesus is is combining baptism and being saved. Now I don't think you can I think you can be saved and not be baptized. Salvation doesn't depend on whether you're being baptized or not. But but baptism is a, a mark of your belief. B it proclaims an acceptance of the new covenant relationship that God made with Jesus. So by being baptized we're saying, okay, I'm I'm in with the covenant relationship between God and Jesus. It's a statement of that fact. See, it's a public confession of an inward change. So it's a very public act to be baptized, unless you have a very small ceremony. But it's a a statement of things have changed on the inside. Someone like to get Colossians 2, 11 and 12. And then somebody else get Titus. In him we were also circumcised. What did you say? Colossians 2. 2, 11 and 12. Yep. In him we were also circumcised with the circumcision made with our hands. By putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Buried with him in baptism. In which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God. Who raised him from the dead. So it's a recognition of the spiritual rebirth experience, a sign of spiritual circumcision. Titus 3 5. He saved us not because of righteous things we have done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So the washing of rebirth and the renewal. So a spiritual birth experience. D. It symbolizes the forgiveness of our sins. So by being baptized, it's symbolizing our acceptance that our sins have been forgiven. We haven't done Acts 22.16. Someone like to grab that one? Acts 22.16. Our sins are washed away and we leave them buried in the waters of baptism. And now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So it's a symbol of all the past life, the sins, the things that we've done to be washed away, left behind in the water that we get up out of. So we come out of it identifying with Christ, which is number E. It's an act of identifying with Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. And we already did the Colossians 2.12. But someone grab Romans 6, 3 to 4. We are united with Christ by being buried with him in the symbolic death so that we can live a new life. Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in unison of life. So it's saying that we're united with him. So it's symbolic of what he did. 
symbolic of us going through that with with Jesus, united with Christ. The old, the old person is left behind in the water. The new person arises, comes up out of the water to new life. Jesus's spotless life permitted God's resurrection power to release him and us to new life. Baptism symbolizes also being clothed with Christ. So I'm going to grab Galatians three twenty seven. Symbolizes being clothed with Christ. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. So just like a garment that we wrap around us, we're clothed with Christ. And then F, it shows a recognition and a unity of one body. Someone do 1 Corinthians and somebody else Ephesians 4, 5, and 6. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. So by going through a, a, a baptism, a, some type of water being involved, says that there is a unity with all the other believers. Mm-hmm. One Corinthians. Well, by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free. So the Holy Spirit baptized baptized us all into one body. Three baptism is an outward symbol of an inner change, an outward symbol of the inner change. The act itself does not save us. Every reference in the New Testament shows that faith is required. So we can't say unless you're baptized you're not saved because it doesn't quite work that way. But it is a symbol, a sign of what's happening on the inside of us. Baptism declares an inner heart change, a, pro- a change of perspective. It's a physical representation of a new spiritual reality. The act is also very personal as it challenges our own issues and perhaps it was designed to do just that. Someone grab Matthew and then somebody else grab John. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were open to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. So when Jesus went through his baptism, it was very personal. It's a very personal touch from God at that point. And John? Now John also was baptizing in whatever I knew. <laughs> because there was much water there and they came and were baptized. So the people in John's time, it was a very personal act that they did. To put underwater or not has become a part of disagreement, a point of disagreement among groups. <coughs> Sometimes we get caught up in the theology of how a person is baptized, that we forget the why they are being baptized. And had we had time, we would have gone into the difference between baptism and dedication as an infant, because a lot of people believe they were baptized as an infant. Uh, Going back through all the different studies, wherever baptism is talked about, it's a choice, it's a personal decision to do that. But the other side of the fence, people say, well, what about um, the jailer, the Cornelius, when he, he and his whole household were baptized? So we aren't told the ages of the people that were baptized. But a lot of people say, well, it could have been that that was children involved with that. It was infants involved with that. And so he, the father was baptized and his whole household was baptized. So some of the theological discussions can get going around those points, but... Uh, how about we won't, because I know we're lots of different different backgrounds and lots of different views. Mm. I personally, that was one reason why I joined a Baptist church, because my personal view is, is that it is submersion, it's water baptism for um, believers mm. as a sign of what's happening to them in their life. But I also respect other people's v- views and other people's opinions and the whole thing. Any comments on baptism? I know it can be a real challenge for some people. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, 
it's there. There'd probably be an interesting correlation compared to those people who accept Jesus but fall away, who don't follow on with their faith, compared to those who do and do so by being baptized. It's probably a, a stronger conversion experience or a stronger statement of faith when a person is water baptized. But for some people, it's a very challenging topic. Mm. Mm-hmm. As an adult. Great morning to pick. Yes. Yes. Um, and yeah, I could fully understand. Freezing. <laughs> <laughs> Tell it like it is. Mm. No. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah, Daniel was baptized in Lake Eildon in the middle of winter. Oh. And that was very cold. So. I actually have been done twice because I mm-hmm. didn't understand that, but now mm-hmm. I think Mm-hmm. When God said, you know, get baptized all the time. So baptized twice. I had a picture mm-hmm. of a river mm-hmm. and a tree, and, you know, I could just picture this, and I thought, you know, it was about August or something, freezing cold. I was mm-hmm. doing that, so they didn't want to bath. Mm-hmm. Then when my daughter wanted to get baptized, we were at someone's place, and Carl went and said, you know, I want to get baptized. I'm thinking, you're only seven. Mm. But I left it up to them to sort it out, and I was out the front of the car, and God said really clearly, "And you too." <laughs> so now you I joined it. They were going to baptize, and by the time I got inside, mm. found out where. You know, when really? we got there, mm. it was the picture I had. Mm. <coughs> yeah, it can be a very mem- memorable experience. Your own baptism. Um, or it could be a disaster, like no water in the tank. It was, it, was really, it, was really mm. bad. it was really horrible. The second one I had that I did a couple of years ago was good. Mm. Yeah. It's good to see they make a, a, a very um, you know, a good experience out of, out of it here at Crossway. I enjoy that. Mm. Then, capital F, the second baptism that John talked about, the baptism of fire. The sanctification process, the baptism of fire. The prophet who came to prepare the Jewish nation for Jesus, John the Baptist, declared, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me will come one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not fit to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. John the Baptist is describing three different kinds of baptism. We have looked at water baptism. Now let's look at the fire baptism. Then we'll consider the Holy Spirit baptism later in this session. Number one, the purifying force of fire. John used the allegory of refining ore with fire for purifying work that occurs when we allow God to cleanse our heart. The message, Matthew 3, 11, puts it this way. <coughs> and again, it's John the Baptist saying, I'm baptizing you here in the river, turning your old life in for a kingdom life. The real action comes next. The main character in this drama, compared to him, I'm a mere stagehand, will ignite the kingdom life within you, a fire within you, the Holy Spirit within you, changing you from the inside out. He's going to clean house, make a clean sweep of our lives. He'll place everything true in its proper place before God. Everything false, he'll put out with the trash to be burned. And that's what sanctification is. Placing everything true in its proper place before God. Everything false, he'll put out with the trash to be burned. Many Christians don't talk much about this part of their walk, especially to new Christians. As a result, few new converts really expect this refining to be part of their journey. When we're born again, there is plenty of old baggage still left in our heart. Reactions and personal challenges are still being brought to the light. Christians need to adopt this attitude from James 1.12. And this you have to take a deep breath when you begin to read it. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. 
because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. So if we get that idea that part of the Christian walk is going to be a refining, is going to be a a purifying process, when it actually begins to happen to us, we're not shocked and ready to to, uh, walk away from the whole thing. In fact, for some people, that's when the main problems start, is when they do come to Jesus. Because up till then, they were just sailing through life without too many problems, they thought. But it was all in there, was all deep inside their heart. (coughs) But I think, again, we've got to remember that God loves us too much to leave that stuff buried there. He loves us too much to see all that junk and rubbish in our heart. He knows that he's only got these 50, 60, 70, 80 years while we're here on earth to get it out of our life. Because we're in heaven, there's not going to be this refining fire. It's not going to be there. So if we get that idea and know that, okay, this is part of what it means to walk with God, it's like it's not such a huge shock, and we can set our mind toward that. We can set our mind to learning principles of how to get through this the quickest, way without going on and on and on and going around the proverbial mountain again and again and again and again. But I know it's it's because God loves us too much to leave all that stuff in there. It's like, I think we've used this example before, but it's like we grow up in this one house and the door squeaks a little bit and the roof leaks a little bit, but we're used to it because that's just our life for however many years. And then along comes the Lord and he says, here, I'll give you this new house. So we say, yes, thank you very much. And we move into this new house. But what happens for most of us, we want to go back into the old house, the old life, and start bringing things out of the old life and trying to do the same thing in our new life. So we drag in that old chest of drawers and put it in the new house. And we drag in that old baggage that we've carried around with us for years and years and years and years. And we put it into the new house and we think we can live in this new house with all the old stuff still there. And the Lord lets us do it for a little while, and then after a while He says, hey, let's deal with some of this stuff that you keep running into the brick wall. You keep going round and round and round in circles. So He says, that bed does not go in that new house. That chest of doors, all that old baggage does not belong in your new house. And so He begins to help us deal with all that stuff that we've just dragged with us into our new life. And that's part of what sanctification is. It's that that um, other big Bible word that talks about acquiring acclamation. It talks about what's what's the word I'm after? Of um, it's like acknowledging it. it. Starts with an A, three syllables. Sounds like <laughs> <laughs> um, sort of like acquiring. What word am I after? Come on, all you Bible students. No. Appropriate. Sorry, it didn't either start with an A. It's appropriating what Jesus has done for us, bringing it into to the new life that he's given us. So we appropriate all that stuff that Jesus did for us to bring the healing of our spirit, healing of our soul, the healing of our body, healing of memories, old hurts, pains, all the things that happened in our past life. The restoration to, to our, our earthly dads is part of that. So we learn to appropriate what God has done for us through Jesus and bring it into our life. And that's part of the Christian walk. It's not something strange and unusual that we go through these sort of issues. It's part of the Christian walk. Any comments on any of that? I know that if we knew 110% and we knew, we really knew that the Christian stuff was real and that heaven was real and where God was was real in our life, that the vast majority of Christians would not be pew sitters. They wouldn't be just, ho oh, hum, another Sunday, I guess I'll go to church today. And so it's working from the unbelief into the faith where you do know that you know that you know that, hey, this Christian stuff is real really is, and someday we're going to be with Jesus. And someday we'll look back on our life and be very glad that we were obedient and doing what he wanted us to do. 
So the purifying force of fire, something, I, I suppose part of it is that there's something about the human spirit that's refined by testing and fire and going through the hard times. It brings something out of the human spirit that's good, that's worthwhile. It can bring something out of the human spirit that's good and it's worthwhile. It can also make people burnt bitter and angry and twisted and all of that. But if we allow life's experience to teach us and to to gain the, like the Valley of Baca stuff, bring the good out of the experiences that we go through. You know, someday we're going to stand at Jesus' side and say, well, Lord, it wasn't easy to go through that, but I'm glad you put me through that because of all the things that I learned. And like we've also said before, it's not, you know, we, we really don't have much of an idea of where we're going to be throughout eternity. So the things we're learning here aren't just for this 50, 60, 70 years here on earth. There's an eternity out there, and I don't think God's just going to wipe away everything that we've learned and said, okay, everybody's perfect. I think He's going to use the things that we learned while we're here on earth. So who knows where eternity's going to be? That's pretty amazing. <clears throat> Two, the transforming of the inner man. This hagimosis, the Greek word for this transformation, is a gradual inward transformation. <laughs> It results in greater purity, better moral attitudes, and more godliness. It's not some strange thing that God has designed just for us Christians. It happens to all that love Him. Three, becoming more like Jesus. The aim of such refining is to build in us the character and the nature of Jesus Christ. Father God aims to build faith in us by allowing us to go through the trials and the tribulations of life. We are called to suffer as Jesus suffered. Someone like to grab that verse in 1 Peter? So then it stands to reason that we will go through things that, allowed to, that allow Him to train and to teach us. And that's what, what we're after. For what credit is it when you are beaten for your faults? You take it patiently, but when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Mm -hmm. So to follow his steps. Capital G, baptism in, by, through, with the Holy Spirit, because there's lots of different people saying lots of different things. So the baptism with, in, by, through the Holy Spirit. And again, this is another controversial topic. So we'll go slow. If you have any comments to make on it, please do. Don't feel like you can't share or talk through some of this. Number one, we have been promised the gift of the Holy Spirit. We've been promised that. God has promised to give every born-again believer the Holy Spirit as a gift. So Acts 2.38, we ought to know that by heart by now. Repent, be baptized, every one of you, and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So God has promised that to every single person who repents, to every single born-again believer. On the day of Pentecost, the disciples were filled with the Spirit, Paul was also filled at his conversion. So there's several instances in the book of Acts where people are filled with the Spirit. Now Paul continued talking. It's not to be a once-off experience. Paul commands Christians to be filled continually with the Spirit. Someone want to grab Ephesians 5.18? And that the word fill in that verse is a word that we don't use very much in our English language, but it means the process of being continually. So keeping on, keeping on, being filled. An ever-present, um, continuous verb that doesn't run out. It's keeping on, being filled. So Paul says to keep on being filled with the Spirit. The filling of the Spirit equips us for service and for living a joy-filled, victorious life. It nudges us toward becoming more and more like Christ. So it's not meant to be a one-off experience. But for most people, myself included, the, the beginning 
act of being baptized in the Holy Spirit so changed, so changes lives. It's like they're never the same again. I remember going through the, the experience, and for me it was not an emotional experience. Uh, it was uh, a pastor invited my mother and myself and about four or five other people to a Bible study. And he opened up the book of Acts, which I'd never read very much of, about um, before, and went through the process of the baptism of the Holy Spirit and what it meant. And then he asked us, would you like to be baptized in the Holy Spirit? And we all said yes. So he came around and laid hands on us. And for me, it was not an emotional experience. In fact, after he'd come and laid hands on me and I just quietly felt the words just beginning to form in my mind and I spoke them through, I actually said, huh, is this all it is? Because it wasn't, I I couldn't tell the five minutes after it happened that things had been different. Just the language was there. So for me, it was not an emotional experience. For other people, it can be a very emotional experience. For some people, it's particularly in the, the, when the Holy Spirit began the movement here in Australia and in the States and lots of other places around the world. It was like they had long midnight tarrying meetings where they tarried to receive the Holy Spirit. And for some some people it went on hour after hour after hour after hour. And I know now that all it would have taken would have been just a, a simple prayer in faith and then encouraging the person just to, to speak it out as though it was theirs, and to step into it with that gift of faith and saying, okay, I have been baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now just begin to let the Lord um, speak through you or the, the language to come through you instead of having to just work for hour after hour after hour. I don't know if any of you have been in those sort of meetings, but in some of my <coughs> early days as a Christian, that's what, what we went to see, and it didn't need to be. So different people have different experiences in the whole thing. But for most people, it changes their life. And for me, it was like it was during the autumn time, and it was like for the first time I saw the trees changing color, and sunsets were just magnificent. And ever since then, sunsets and uh, the autumn trees have meant something very special to me. And it's never been the same. Hmm. So, the baptism of fire, baptism of the Holy Spirit, becoming more like Jesus. So, over on to page, where we up to page 6. 2. Controversy in the church world over baptism. Nothing has rocked the modern day church in the last 60 years like the controversy surrounding the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Both sides of the debate have allowed the enemy to tear apart families and churches, build walls between people, and form new movements out of the divisions. Many claim there is only one infilling of the Spirit, but that contradicts what the Bible says. The disciples had more than one experience with the Holy Spirit. The first infilling was on the evening of Resurrection Sunday. It's interesting, if you go over to John 20, 21 to 22, Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. So whether this was the receiving of the Holy Spirit in a sense of now you can begin to believe that I am the Christ, that I am the Messiah. And so that was the the, uh, gift of the Holy Spirit that everyone receives in order to know that Jesus is the Christ. That could be. Because we know the second infilling of the Holy Spirit happened when the Holy Spirit came upon them 50 days later at Pentecost. Many called this a baptism of the Holy Spirit. In Acts 2, 3, and 4, they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So we see that there are at least two now, I'm, uh, Daniel went through these notes, and his word is the infilling. I don't know if I would quite agree that there are two infillings of the Holy Spirit, certainly two experiences of the Holy Spirit. But whether you would say back in John 20, 21, that that was an infilling of the Holy Spirit, I would probably question that of my Daniel. 
So certainly if you want to put two experiences, I'd let you do that. So two experiences, at least two experiences of the Holy Spirit. And we need a refilling possibly every day. So we need that walk closer to the Lord, keeping on, keeping on being filled with the Holy Spirit every day. Any comments on that? You can agree, disagree, or whatever. <laughs> Three. The yeah. I personally experience being with people who are spiritually dry and attempt to take your spirit. Mm-hmm. They need to be with mm-hmm. people who are spirit filled. It's like a topping up. Yeah. You know, one's draining, one's topping. Yes. If you're continually with a group of people who drain, uh, you've got to go somewhere to find re- replenishment. Mm-hmm. That's and a good way to, to be put it. A, another way, to my thoughts, of Christ putting us with other people. Because I don't feel you really top yourself up. You, mm-hmm. know, you need to be in, it's not, as you were saying, so much an emotional experience, even, mm-hmm. just, a, just all of a sudden, it's just this feeling that uh, mm-hmm. you, you, you change. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, I just find that, but I find it very difficult to talk about that with a lot of Christians. Mm-hmm. Maybe I've never realised before, because I always thought it was a topping up anyway. Yeah. But some people believe that you have received it, and if you don't mm-hmm. feel it now, well, really, you're doing something wrong. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think that puts a lot of people on the back foot. Yes. <coughs> yep. Yes, and a lot of people... Um, feel like they've had the baptism of the Holy Spirit and then that's it. So they don't see any need for closer walk with the Lord or being with other people or getting a refilling from the Lord. Mm. Yeah, that's true. Number three, the Holy Spirit helps us understand the spiritual. Helps us understand the spiritual. Without the Holy Spirit, we would not even comprehend the spiritual realities around us. The Holy Spirit comes into our life, releases His power, and helps, begins to help us really believe that Jesus of Nazareth is the Christ. The Holy Spirit then goes on to purify the believer and set him or her free to bring others into the kingdom. So a lot of, a lot of the controversy of people that say, well, that, that you already have the Holy Spirit when you're a believer is very true, because there's no way you'd even be able to know who Jesus is without the Holy Spirit. But there's a difference between the Holy Spirit showing you the spiritual reality of Jesus and the Holy Spirit being an infilling of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I I don't think a lot of of church-going people get past that first breath. Mm -hmm. I don't don't think it's as far as that infilling that met Jesus Mm -hmm. and felt the breath that they Yeah. Yeah. And they don't even almost don't want to take the other breath because they don't believe that it's necessary. Mm. Mm. No, because they've already had it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, <laughs> I think that that's probably the biggest reason why the baptism of the Holy Spirit is important because it's like that's the doorway into the spiritual dimension. I don't think it's that last little bit of sacrifice. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now that doesn't mean that once you are baptized in the Holy Spirit, you don't have that struggle anymore of who's in control. <laughs> but certainly that is part of what keeps people from going on for the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Or they don't know what's going to happen, or they don't want to turn into all these other wacky people around them and do funny things. And, mm, and they don't feel the need for it. Mm-hmm. It's true. It's so unusual one of his writings and he was saying that the Holy Spirit mm-hmm. if you think back to your non-Christian days it has allowed you to love a group of weird people mm-hmm. who you always thought were weird because they were yes. Christian and did all these funny things like yes. reading Bibles and having Bible studies and mm-hmm. basically that, that's it it, mm-hmm. it does it gives you that in feeling yes. and once you're in there you do come out again so you still need that ring that's true yeah, yeah. 
Well, there's been lots of church splits. I'm sure most of you know stories of, of churches that have split over this or families that have split over this. And, and um, it was very destructive the way people handled it in the beginning when the Holy Spirit was, was being renewed in the churches. So a lot of people want nothing to do with it either because they think they've got, a, got enough of the Holy Spirit already or it's just not their church tradition. They're not exposed to it. They don't feel that there's any need for it. But it's like trying to run a car on, on two drops of petrol and the rest water. and it just doesn't work. So there's no way you can go on and be the, the witness that God wants you to be to others unless you do have that experience. It certainly makes a big difference. Where are we up to? Number four, the Holy Spirit provides the power to be the witness for Jesus. The power to be the witness for Jesus. How about, that's probably a good point to stop it. Let's stop at that point and go get a cuppa. And we'll pick that one up when we come back. Okay. All right, we're up to number four on page six. That's where we started before we went and took our break. So the Holy Spirit provides the power to be a witness for Jesus. Basically, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is for power that we might be better witnesses for Christ. So I'm going to grab Acts 1.8. The gifts Paul talked about in 1 Corinthians 12 are to help us convert pre-believers and to minister to other believers. People who experience the baptism talk about a deeper prayer life, more peace, joy, and love for God. In Appendix A, when we finish this, we'll take a few minutes, and just a short but Bible study on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, and all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So the, one of the things the Holy Spirit brings is a power, a power to be a better witness. Five, how do you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? How do you receive the baptism? We receive the baptism by prayer, Luke 11, 9 to 10, asking God for the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's deeper work in our own life. Some receive the baptism through the prayer of others. This experience is not meant to be the pinnacle of our Christian life. For many, it's only the beginning of their deeper experience with the Holy Spirit. Christians differ on whether a person who is baptized with the Spirit would inevitably speak in tongues as proof of His presence. Some say yes. Others point to other gifts the Holy Spirit gives to help us in our service to Him. What is most important is that we are open in our heart and mind to receive the power and the joy that the Spirit yearns to pour out on us. So the Holy Spirit wants to give us the joy, the power, the peace, all the things that come with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We probably each one have our own view on, on about um, tongues. I, I sort of see it as the badge that comes along with it, that it's part of our inheritance when we receive the Holy Spirit. For a lot of, a lot of people, it's like, well, it's like you were saying, Jan, it's that last little bit of giving over the control to God, of um, giving over our, our tongue and being able to say words that we've never studied and never never tried to understand, never tried to, to uh, learn with our mind. Because it is a, a real stretching, it's an um, unfathomable thing, your own prayer language. And I think it's it's an inheritance for every single person. A lot of times in counseling, when we help people work through this area, it's more because the mind doesn't want to let go. It's more because the mind wants to keep control that a person doesn't speak in tongues, rather than it's not part of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I think it is. So for a lot of people, it's a journey. Uh, part of Daniel's testimony is that he had one word when he was baptized in the Holy Spirit. So he said that one word over and over, and pretty soon he had a second word. And he'd say those two words over and over and over. But it was a process of six months before he had a fluent prayer language of his own. And the biggest reason for that was just the getting past the mental block of letting go and yielding to the Holy Spirit to be able to say the words, not because God didn't want to give him those words. Now he's got two or three different languages that he uses. 
So it's a growth thing. It's, it doesn't come automatically for every person, although I believe it is part of their inheritance that, that can come with it if, that's, if the person will yield themselves and open themselves up to it. Any comments to any of that? If you don't speak in tongues, mm-hmm. does that mean you're not, you're not spirit-filled? You're still are? You still are? Well, I'd like to take the position that when we ask Jesus to do it, he does it. It's not that, oh, Jesus didn't do it because I haven't spoken in tongues. I take the position that when we ask Jesus to do it, and we were sincere in it, the Lord did do that. Because a lot of people, even though they can't speak in tongues, can still testify to the huge difference in their own life. But then for me, for um, working through people to the language, again, it's more like the mind is blocking it rather than the Lord hasn't given it. And sometimes people are concentrating so hard on receiving the language that they get all so tight and tense about it that often when they go back home and relax and, you know, sometimes later, sometimes taking a shower or waking up the next morning, the language just begins to flow. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. prayer and they just can't. I mean, with me, I had to do it a few times before I, I could do it. Mm-hmm. But with them, they've tried and they just said, no, it's not for me. That they have just given up. Mm-hmm. And... I guess that's one reason why I take the stand that when they did ask, they were baptized at that point. They may not have had their prayer language, but it will come later if they have someone that helps them just sit and work it through, sit and pray it through, and and often just begin to, I mean, for all of us, just to begin to say the words was pretty, you know, that's a big step of faith to begin to say all these strange syllables that were put into a language. But whether they don't have exactly everything they need when they're in the warfare situation, I'm not sure. Probably still depends on how much anointing there is on their life and what the Lord's asking them to do. As I know with me, when, I, when there's times where I've been in a battle, mm-hmm. I've had to just start praying in tongues mm-hmm. because it was intense. And through that, I was able to have a breakthrough. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, some people it could be that, that not having that prayer language, it's, it's like not having one tool in their toolbox. Mm. And so they either find other tools or the Lord shows them other ways to get around it. Mm. But I think that the not speaking in tongues is more on our side of the fence than it is on the Lord's not giving it to us. Mm-hmm. Any other comments? I knew someone who didn't ask for it who was baptized. Mm-hmm. So someone who didn't ask for it, and the Lord just sovereignly baptized them, yes. Yeah. I think she was very angry with it. Whenever it came up, usually when I talk about it, she was very angry with it. It was when uh, everyone was going to Dingway, mm-hmm. and she came home one night. She didn't tell us. It was weeks later, we were all over it. And um, yeah, while she was down on the floor, mm. she started speaking. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Probably the most um, humorous, I suppose, in, in God's sense of humor, was of a pastor we heard that, that uh, was in the middle of preaching a, how many, I think, five sessions on why the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not for us today. <laughs> and so guess what happened on the fifth speech, it's be, uh, preaching he did. He was baptized in the Holy Spirit. But the, the the ironic thing about it that he and his the church was so anti baptism of the Holy Spirit that all those who believed in the baptism of the Holy Spirit had left the church. So all he had left in the congregation was all of those who did not believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So he found himself one believer and the whole rest of these congregation did not, even though they almost saw it in front of him. And so they left. So he had only these little handful of people that were willing to find out what the truth was. And then he built the, ch- the congregation back up again. But the Lord's sense of humor. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Any other comments about the Holy Spirit? Although we're going to talk a little bit more about it at the uh, <coughs> Appendix A when we get there. <coughs> Capital H, Knowing Jesus, who is the Christ and the Lord of all. Observ- observable Christian growth doesn't just happen. 
we need to make some behavioral changes as well to match the inner changes. Just like there are three parts to Jesus' honorable name, so there are three stages of growth and maturity in the Christian journey. We can know the Lord Jesus Christ at least three ways, and it's just like his name, Lord Jesus Christ. We can know Jesus as the Christ, the Anointed One, the Messiah, who gave his life to turn us back to God. When we accept Jesus as the Christ, Father God adapts, adopts us into, his, into the family of God. We call this a born-again experience. So there's no way that you can be a Christian, a born-again Christian, and not know Jesus as the Christ, the Christos, the Messiah, the one that came to bring back human beings to God. So you mean um, people who are just Christians but not born again don't know Jesus? How can you be a Christian and not be born again? Christian in just a name, like just the tradition well, this, of being... The, well, they're saying that there's spirit-filled, like born again, and there's... Christians and born again Christians. This is what I've been told. And I've met people, yeah. and I, I, I said, I'm, I'm a born again Christian. They said, What's that? We're only Christians. But they're not. My mum says she's a Christian. She's not. Yeah. So, unless it's talking about just the, the churchgoer who doesn't really know Jesus, who's there because, oh, it's a Christian culture, and my family was all Christian, so I must be a Christian. But they really haven't met Jesus, so there'd be a whole group of people in the church like that. Mm. So I know a lot who aren't born again, mm-hmm. and they say they're Christians, they're just Christian. Mm-hmm. And I said, what's the difference? And I'm thinking, well, aren't you born? Aren't you? I, I, presume that every, I presume that every person that accepts Jesus as Saviour is born again. Mm-hmm. But they're saying that, no, we're just Christians, we're not born again. So then the, the question would be whether they really do accept Jesus as Saviour. Mm-hmm. To them, it's like the social club. They belong to a tennis club, the church, whatever. But it's not a real heart belief. It hasn't been a change. Because that's what the born-again experience is, is your heart's changed. And so life is different. Okay. So you can know Jesus is Christ. And then two, Jesus as Lord. Jehovah has elevated Jesus to the highest level and has given him the authority and the power to guide us to a better life. Matthew seventeen five. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud enveloped them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. So Jesus is Lord. Lord was a title for authority, and there's various verses in the Old Testament where Lord was applied. The term Lord recognizes a position of status, prestige, and power. So instead of saying uh, Prime Minister Howard, it would have been Lord Howard in the Old Testament times. So Lord was just a title of position and power. Now Jesus is Lord. Someday he will return that way, the conquering king of kings. He is the returning Christ, judge, and future king. One day everyone will know and recognize him for who he is. But right now, he's allowing us the choice of whether we recognize him as Lord in our lives. Although he is Lord, with or without our permission. Other verses that help us understand lordship, and there's some other verses that I put in there. Then the third way you can know Jesus, remember we're working on Lord Jesus Christ, the third way is Jesus as a person. Jesus is the friend that is closer than the brother. He's a real human being living in an uncorruptible but physical body in the heavenly realm. He is the first of many such beings called the forerunner in Hebrews 6.12. So you can know Jesus in one of those three ways. And I've often worked with people that know Jesus as that friend, the closer than their brother. So they know Jesus as the Savior, And they know Jesus is that friend, but they have no idea of Jesus as Lord. And I've worked with people who know Jesus as Savior and as Lord, but they don't know Jesus as the person. So we need to know Jesus in all three of those ways for growth in our own life. People can know him in only one aspect of his role, such as the Messiah, without ever knowing about his lordship over their lives. However, it's most rewarding when we know him in all three ways. So I can know Jesus is Christ. In fact, everybody in this room knows Jesus is Christ. That's the restoration back to God the Father. 
Some people know Jesus as that friend, but they don't know Jesus as the Lord. And for real growth to happen in our lives, we have to step into that allowing Jesus to be Lord in our lives so that we can have the victory, we can have the celebration of knowing who Jesus is. So we need to know Jesus just like his name, Lord Jesus Christ. All three of those different aspects of Jesus so we can have victory in our life. Capital I, growth in the kingdom. Grace is God's transforming gift of favor to those who do not deserve it. The gift of grace, the gift, sorry, the gift of salvation and forgiveness of sins is available by faith for all who accept him. So many miss his gifts because they rely on themselves. Others try to earn grace by keeping what they think are God's requirements. And this, again, is another area that I find in counseling, that a lot of people come in and, and they've come from a family where you have to work hard in order to be loved and accepted. So what are they trying to do with God? Work hard to try to be loved and accepted. And so it's a very performance-based Christianity. It's a very much trying really hard to keep all the rules and the regulations. And, and depending on which church you're at, a lot of churches add more rules and regulations. So a lot of people really work hard to try to be acceptable, to try to earn God's favor. And we know it doesn't work. Number one, the basis of the old nature. The basis of the old nature. Jesus came to bring the truth that God loves us. Therefore, we must be worth loving. In our blinded and ignorant state, we cannot do this for ourselves any more than we can help ourselves be born as a baby. We are in need of a Savior and a born-again experience to save us from the sin-infected, deceived old nature. And we can't do that ourselves. Like I said, you can't do that any more than you could help yourself being born as a, as a baby. In fact, the best help you could do for yourself in being born was to do what? Relax, that's right. Stop struggling, stop trying, stop squirming so much and just rest in what, what the birth process was going to be. Now, not only mother but baby could do that too. Don't wrestle, don't wrestle. Yeah. Just wrestle in his arms and don't wrestle. Number two, out of the being comes the doing. Out of the being comes the doing. An important part of Christian growth comes by understanding the concepts of God's law versus God's grace. Any striving to please Him, which can, th can even be following instructions to gain His approval, or the approval of others, is working under law. Jesus came to bring the message, Hey, Dad isn't angry at us anymore, and it's safe to come home. That was Jesus' main message. Mm -hmm. Out of our response of love for Him, we can do for Him. We need to see that doing the business of being a Christian is not earning our salvation. Doing and being are two different sets of Christian walk. So the difference between the doing and the being. And most of us have grown up in, in churches that really emphasize all the doing stuff. Thinking that that's the best way to please God. But there's a big difference between the doing and the being. And we please God just by the being because we are His children and we are growing. And that pleases Him. Not because we go to church three times on Sunday and take communion once a week and we do all the other good things that we're supposed to be doing. That's proof of who we are. It's part of our, our doing, but our being comes first. So just being in God comes first. Otherwise, we get into a lot of striving, a lot of pushing, a lot of self-trying to get things organized and do for God. When God just wants us to be, just wants us to have relationship with Him. And out of that relationship, then comes the doing, comes the service, the, the practicing the gifts or whatever it is that we're talking about. So out of the being comes the doing, not the other way around. Number three, grace calls us into being because of His love. Grace calls us into being because of His love. In Jesus, we begin a new covenant with blessings and responsibilities. 
We begin with Jesus and end with Jesus. His work is sufficient for us to find God. I can do nothing to the process of His work. My part is to respond, is responding to His work, to rest in what He has done for me. Hebrews 4, 7 to 10. Would someone like to grab that? Because that's a very interesting verse. Again, he designated a certain day, saying in David, Today, after such a long time, has, as it has been said, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterwards have spoken of another day. There remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered his rest as he has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. Now in reading the commentary for this verse, it's like the the commentator said that this had a lot to do with our place in heaven and that we were going to be resting in God in heaven. But I see something far different in these verses, that it's possible to enter into God's rest how? How do we enter into God's rest now? By doing what? By spending time with him. Mm-hmm. True. Keep going. How do I find rest in my... By well, just, uh, just quieting down your spirit um, and just rest in him. Mm-hmm. Yep. And Keep allow going. Him, allow him to um, speak to you if he wants to, if mm-hmm. he has something to say to you. And just, just to stop everything and quieten down and just... Him. Okay, that's that's one way to do it. The other is to step into what Jesus has actually done for me. So because Jesus has um, done all the work for us, and when he said it's finished on Calvary, that's exactly what it was. It was finished. So by us stepping into his promises and not us pushing to do things in ourselves, we are actually resting in God. We're resting in what Jesus has done for us. So God has called us into a Sabbath day rest. And that Sabbath day rest is stepping into what Jesus has done for us. So we rest in the finished work of of Jesus, not us having to push and work and strive and do and go and be. That we can rest in Him because we're stepping into what Jesus has done for us. So our faith is being built and we're resting in Jesus. Does that make sense? That's a strong message I've been getting for about three months. Mm-hmm. Yeah, basically just saying, <laughs> rest, come back and be with me. Yep. I keep getting yeah. on just God. stopping. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Really? Yep. In fact, I know that you know that's the only path that really brings the victory because it's in the resting in Him that He drops in the little jewels, the little treasures, the little keys that help us do what it is that we need to do. It's when we're quiet enough, yeah, we can hear His voice that tells us what we need to do. And the more we can enter into that resting, the better it is for us. Because I reflect back when I was in the bank. Mm-hmm. It was listening and being in the strength. Mm-hmm. And then I entered the doing. And the doing saps at your strength because it's not in mm-hmm. the being to be there. Mm-hmm. It's true. It in a sense. What I feel is as a misdirected loyalty to God. Mm-hmm. He's saying that's not what I want you for. I want yeah. So please. So when he says that to me, I just find it hard because there's things I'm locked into. I'm not mm-hmm. really locked into, but the yeah. withdrawal yes. is going to hurt some people. Yes. But he's really saying to me that's his. Mm-hmm. And he's got something. So, yeah. yeah. It really is at the tuggy. Yeah. yeah. So we're talking baggage before. If there's any baggage I'm carrying in this new life. Mm-hmm. Is that sort of baggage mm-hmm. of, mm-hmm. of news? Of mm-hmm. Sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Yep, I understand. Then the, probably the more you get into um, system church stuff, the more you're you're drained in the in the doing rather than encouraged to be and stop and rest in the Lord and just be with Him. The more. You get into church stuff, the more you encourage us to keep doing and doing and going and, and getting involved with this and being there and doing that. And, and uh, if we don't get that balance right, if we don't get the, the being first, it can be very draining. And you know, a lot of people go into burnout because of it. So getting that balance right is very important for all of us. Mm-hmm. Yep. 
So, grace calls us into being because of his love. And he loves us so much, that's what he wants. It's like if, if Daniel and I got married, and then all I wanted him to do was to do things for me. Where would my love for him be? You know, if I measured how much he loved me by how much he did all of these things, it would be a, a bit of a hopeless relationship. Where the love grows because we sit and we are together. We are being together. And that's where the love grows. And that's just what God's calling each one of us to do, is to sit and be with Him. And that's where the love grows. Not the go, 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 do, do, do stuff that happens so easily. So the doing and the being is very important. The number four, another thing that helps us in the growth in the kingdom, avoiding a sin-based theology. A sin-based theology. We are all born with what the Bible calls the old nature in an inherited inner heart self-centeredness following the path Adam and Eve started in the Garden of Eden. This includes an endless amount of unresolved, inherited, and learned baggage we all carry around. We live out of those inner attitudes and motives that our heart has stored away. As Christians, the Lord wants us to deal with the things that hinder our growth or that block relationship with others. Sometimes, however, confession aims at the sin, but then pushes us into trying harder not to do that sin again. If we haven't reached a hard understanding as to why we did what we did, we use self-effort to keep from committing the sin again. How is God's way different? By relying totally on Him. So it's like if, if the Holy Spirit convicts me that I'm doing something wrong. Uh, what's a good example? Sorry? Line. Okay, we'll use that one, although that's not something is in my heart. The Lord worked that a long time ago. So let's say, okay, the Lord's convicting me that I'm just shading the truth a little bit too much and I've stepped over the line and He calls it line. And so I say, okay, Lord Jesus, I see. I have sinned against you. And I, I ask you to forgive me for that sin and that you take that sin away. And so I start really believing that He's going to do that. But in order... For me to not lie again, I probably have to use a whole lot of self-effort to keep watching myself, to avoiding, avoid being in that trap again, to be super honest and to try to be the discipline to make myself do what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. And therefore, my focus is on the sin in the whole thing, what I've done wrong, and now I'm trying harder not to do that sin again. Compared to what? What's a true repentance that we need to get to? is out of the heart. So when I spend time with the Lord and say, okay, Lord, yes, I did lie, and I'm sorry, please forgive me for that, and Lord, show me why I did that, or how is that stuck in my heart somewhere? And He shows me, okay, um, sometimes a person lies because the truth is just too confronting, or they're going to be so embarrassed to say the truth, or they think people are going to look down on them if they say the truth, or they think people are, are going to just walk away from them if they're honest. And so it's like just slight shades of gray to change the truth. Now when I understand that and it gets from here down into my heart, and I say, okay, I confess that I've lied because other people's opinion are more important to me than your opinion, Lord. When I get the heart stuff down that far, then I'm digging out the actual wrong that I've done, the sin that I've done. But my focus is not on trying to not do it again. My focus is on what? On the heart stuff and Jesus helping me get that stuff out of my heart. Not just trying to work harder so I don't have to do it again. And when we just work harder so we don't have to do it again, that puts the, the, the focus back on the sin rather than on Jesus. So be aware of that. Next time when you feel the Holy Spirit convicting you that you've done something wrong, just sort of step back and observe yourself, whether it pushes you into a sin-based theology, so that means that you're just going to try harder not to do that sin again, or can you allow the Holy Spirit to let it just get deep enough down into your heart that you understand why you did what you did, and that's where the repentance comes in. And that, that whole thing will be broken then and you never will do it again because your heart is out of your heart now. It's not just trying harder to be good. 
because that's a sin-based theology. Can you see the difference? Mm-hmm. I can experience the difference mm-hmm. in a huge way. Six months ago, I stopped smoking. Mm-hmm. That's a good and example. It was because God kept convicting me that first, um, you know, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, mm-hmm. and I'm breaking away. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's not good. And I've tried giving up smoking before and was never successful because mm-hmm. I was trying so hard not to do it. Yes. And this time I said, all right, well, I'm just, I'll stop. Mm-hmm. And I haven't even had an urge mm-hmm. to smoke again. And I just, I know that I know that I know that mm-hmm. it's God that did that, not me. Yeah, smoking is a good example of that. Because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. that would happen to me. Yeah. yeah. That's good. Mm-hmm. And so, so many people are hooked into smoking for so many different reasons that if they just try harder, uh-huh, yeah. well, that's usually the, the biggest reason is the rebellion. I know someone that, that any time she gets in a tough spot, she says, well, I guess I'll just show you God, and she goes out and has a smoke. <laughs> she doesn't deal with the issues. It's just a, a, a way of, of sort of blowing smoke in God's face and saying, so there. Mm-hmm. And yeah, rebellion. So until you can get down to the heart issues of that very thing, you can't quit smoking. And people just try harder, and then they try harder, and then they try harder. And all it does is turn it into a sin-based focus rather than a Jesus-based focus of why we're doing what we're doing. Let me turn it off for a minute. Okay. So avoid a sin-based theology. So just be aware next time when the Holy Spirit convicts you that you're doing something wrong and see if it's a where your focus is on the whole thing. Jay, conclusion. For some people, taking the step to become a Christian begins a long, great journey. Salvation actually happens because God came looking for us rather than we sought Him out. And probably that's 99% of people that uh, we find Jesus. is isn't because we're on this great quest for truth. And we spend lots of hours trying to find out what is truth, and we go looking for God. Most of us, God went looking for us, and we ran into Him looking for us, that we came into His kingdom. And it's a good thing He loves us that much that He comes and does that for us. Mm -hmm. The journey begins with repentance, a jolting realization that God is real, and that His kingdom is in total opposition to our self-centered little world. The extent to which we allow this gift of God to penetrate our independent heart is the depth that we have in God. So if I'm just a surface Christian that has never allowed God to convict me of the past stuff, the baggage you were talking about, then that's the depth of the Christian I'm going to be. Because we can only grow as deep as what we've let God into our life, into our heart. Next week, we'll continue the theme of changing sides. We'll talk about who and what is the church, the rites and rituals we follow and why. Then we'll end our time with a survey of spiritual gifts and finding your place in the body of Christ. Any comments? And any of that? Okay, I've added an appendix here. This is one we actually did last year in our workshop. Um, but people really enjoyed the uh, bit of the Bible study that went with it. So what I thought I'd do is put it in as an Appendix A for us today, tonight. So, what is the purpose of receiving the Holy Spirit? And there's five reasons to receive the Holy Spirit. And one we've already talked about, to receive power needed to be the witness. Acts 1.8, and that's one that I think it was Maria read that, that uh, you will receive power from on high to be a witness. Mm. So the first reason is to receive the power needed to be a witness. Then be in obedience to Jesus' direction. How about somebody grab the verse in John, somebody do Luke, somebody in First John, and then over in Ephesians. In obedience to Jesus' directions. John 7, 37 and 39. On the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the Scriptures have said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And the but, this is, but this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. 
So this is the actual gift that Jesus was talking about and he wanted us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Third, it's his desire to live in us and to help us. Luke eleven thirteen. So if we're evil, and it goes a little bit earlier, it talks about if you have a child and wants to have bread, you won't give him a scorpion. And if Jesus said, if you're in the old nature, evil by nature, how much more will God give good things to those people who ask him for good things? Then it's his will for us as a New Testament church in the New Covenant. So 1 John five fourteen and 15. Now this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he will hear us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. So we know that we can have the Holy Spirit because that's one that's something that Jesus wants for us. So he will grant those petitions. Then it's a continuous gift to help us live and understand the Christian walk. Ephesians five eighteen. So to be filled with the Spirit it's continuously, continuing to be f- filled, ever present, present state of mind, state of being, because that's how we understand the Christian walk. Now, in the, in the ten, there's ten different places, and we just want to do a quick study on about the badge, your own private prayer language. So notice when we talk about these verses, who, when, how, and what happened in each of these different verses. So, Mark sixteen seventeen. This is called the Great Commission. And these signs are to follow believers. And these signs will follow those who believe in my name. They will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. Mm-hmm. So this is one of the signs that are supposed to be following the believers. There came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then they appeared to them divided tongues as a fire, and one set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So who was it? Well, this was the, the group of the, the disciples. The Holy came on them. And the Holy Spirit came on them. The disciples, the women that followed Jesus, they were all together. Mm-hmm. Now previously, remember, these were the, the, the men that deserted Jesus, that were afraid that the, the Sanhedrin and all the temple guards were going to come knock on their door and cart them off to prison just as well. So they were a group of 11 men on fire for God, saying, let's go get them. No, they were afraid. Peter had denied the Lord. And now he, w- he was quivering, waiting for uh, whatever was going to happen. They'd seen the risen Jesus, so they knew that reality, what reality was. But they still were just waiting for the Holy Spirit to be poured out, because that's what told, Jesus told them to do. So when? This was the day of Pentecost, which again, is one of the, each of the festivals from the Old Testament that the Jewish nation had is a very important festival. All the types and the symbols and the shadows of the day of Pentecost was exactly when the Holy Spirit was given out. And how? The sound is a mighty rushing wind, the tongues of fire, and they heard them speak with tongues, with different languages. Now, the Holy Spirit is given to whom? What's the promise? Acts 2, 38 and 39. Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remissions of sin, and you shall receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And whether they knew way back then of Australia's existence or not, probably not, 
but we would be certainly considered to those who are afar off. So is that promise to us today? Mm-hmm. Yes. To your children, to your on your other to children's children, to as many as the Lord God calls. And every single one of us have been called. Now there were Samaritan believers. Remember Samaritans were the group that were part Jews, that they were the, the poor, the the uh, people that had been left in the land when the nation of Israel went into exile, when they went into Babylon. There was a group of, of Jews left behind that intermarried with all the other Gentiles around the nations. So the Samaritan believers, now they had a belief in God, but they didn't have any knowledge of the Holy Spirit. So notice how it's given. Acts eight fourteen and 17. Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard the Samaria and received the word of God... They sent Peter and John to them, who when they had come down, prayed for them, and they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he had fallen upon none of them. They they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands on them and received the Holy Spirit. So they'd been baptized in water. So they knew a baptism of repentance. They'd known Jesus as Savior. But this group of people had not even heard that there was a Holy Ghost or what it had to do with them. So how was it given in this case? For laying on of hands. So sometimes the Holy Spirit comes when a person is sitting in their bedroom reading the Bible all by themselves. But the most common experience that people receive the Holy Spirit is through laying on of hands. And it's pretty amazing when you think that if the person that I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit with, this pastor that I was talking about, he received it because somebody laid hands on him. That person received it because somebody laid hands on him. And if if you could trace back the history of who laid hands on who and go back further and further and further and further, you'd find someone way back there the day of Pentecost that received the Holy Spirit and laid hands on somebody else. Isn't that a neat thought? (laughs) So I had a direct touch from the Holy Spirit that had gone down through those generations of people who laid hands on on each other out of obedience. Mm -hmm. Yes. Now that would be a fascinating one, especially when you go back through the, the dark ages when Christianity was almost stamped out. Belief in Jesus was just in a, a few monasteries. You know, a few monks had a reality of Jesus during the dark ages when it was almost stamped out. And the preciousness of the Bible, times when it was just miraculous. You know, they were at the door to burn it and destroy the manuscripts and it just got snuck out the back door just in time. So those sort of genealogies, that'd be fascinating. Mm. Yeah, we'll have to say, Jesus, can you show us that? <laughs> that would be really neat. And yeah, and then again in Paul's conversion, so Acts nine seventeen to 19. And Ananias went his way and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. So when he had received food, he was strengthened. Then Saul spent, spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. Mm-hmm. So in this particular place, it doesn't talk about Paul receiving the gift of tongues. But over in Corinthians, Paul talks about, I, I would that everybody speak in tongues and not to forbid tongues. And he says, I speak in tongues more than all of you together. Mm-hmm. So we know that Paul did receive the gift of, the lang- of his own language. Mm-hmm. Believers in Ephesus, again, here they were saved without knowledge of the Holy Spirit. So Acts nineteen one to six. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, Then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. 
On hearing this, they were baptized into the one into the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. So again, here's another laying on of hands experience. Um, 1 Corinthians 14, where Paul talks about how he uses tongues both for personal and in church meetings. Then he also goes on to say tongues are for a sign. And then that he says he speaks in tongues more than those in uh, the other Corinthians. Acts 14, or sorry, 1 Corinthians 14, 39, not to forbid tongues. Somebody go on and grab that one. That's an interesting one. So we're told specifically to, to desire prophecy. Why prophecy? Why is that a better gift than tongues? It's got here in um, verse 4, a person who speaks in tongues is strengthened personally in the Lord, but one who speaks the word of prophecy strengthens the entire church. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So prophecy being in, in English or whatever language that church is in, Unless, the, unless there's an interpretation of the tongues. Yeah. So I, I think that there's, there's a personal prayer language and then there's a gift of tongues for the whole church. And sometimes it's the same one, but not very often is it the same language. So you can have your own prayer language and not ever have give a message in tongues in the church. That it's not necessarily the same thing. So, Luke eleven ten. this is probably a good one to end on. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be given, it will be open. So we need to do what? Seek. And find and knock. And, knock. And, it and it will be. And God's mm-hmm. promised us that the, the answers that we need in our own life will be there for us. So those <coughs> who need to seek, need to seek to knock, and it will be given to us. Any comments on that? Mm-hmm. Yes, I've heard of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've heard of, of, of English people being in a, a meeting somewhere overseas, in a church meeting, and someone stands up and speaks in English, and it's a gift of, of tongues to the whole church. Or vice versa, someone being in one of our meetings and tongues happen and they're from a you know, somewhere else, and they come to the person and say, do you know you were speaking in ancient Greek or, or something like that? Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's pretty amazing. I can see one reason why God did do the, the tongues, because it really confounds the mind. The mind just goes, tilt, I don't understand any of this. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. Mm. I don't know. Some teachings I've heard that he does understand, others he doesn't, and... You just don't know. Yeah. In some ways, it's more that the Holy Spirit understands the tongues. That's what the important is, because that's where the anointing comes and the power comes. Yeah, that comes through for our own, our own edification in the whole thing. Okay, any last-minute comments, questions? Okay, how about I pray for you, and then we'll stop. Yeah. Well, Lord Jesus, we want to thank you that you did send the Holy Spirit. And as we saw a few weeks ago, the, all the, the hundreds of things that the Holy Spirit does for each one of us. And Lord, we want to thank you for that. That in your design, you knew we couldn't do this by ourselves. And so, Lord, you sent the Holy Spirit to help each one of us. And Lord, may we have a, a greater and greater understanding and revelation of who the Holy Spirit is and what the Holy Spirit is doing in our life. And Lord, we thank you that that you have touched each one of us here. You have touched our life. You have brought a peace and a healing and a wholeness to each one of us here. And Lord, we want to thank you for that. And we ask that you touch those people still among us that, that are struggling physically and that you bring a wholeness to them, Lord Jesus. In your precious name, amen.